This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Uh, okay, everyone, uh, what, what I've done is um, uh, I've negotiated with the uh, organisers because it's been a really long day. Uh, we're going to be strictly about half an hour in order to have time for a consumption of vast amounts of alcohol um, before uh, we start again at seven. So we're just going to do a very, very informal um, uh, talk for um, th 30 minutes or so, trying to open it up as much as possible to questions. Uh, that have been raised uh, through the day. So, um, just quickly then to run along the panel, this is John Reader, uh, he's talking tomorrow. Right. This is Cheryl Vint, who's also the plenary uh, tomorrow. This is Caroline... Press it. <laughs> Caroline Press it. I did know that, I just, I just had a blank. This is, uh, this is why we need to have alcohol. <laughs> uh, Caroline Press it, excuse me, from University of Sussex, uh, and this is Joe Sutcliffe Sanders. Uh, uh, we're keeping an eye on him because he likes the cross. Um, and uh, he's also talking tomorrow. So it's kind of quite difficult for these guys because we don't want to pre anticipate what you're going to say. What I um, wanted to start with, I've, I've sent them all a question to think about um, through the afternoon. <laughs> and I expect good answers. Um, and my question really was that it's, it's really striking that there are certain authors. Uh, in the culture, um, both here in Britain and also in the States, that become kind of really significant placeholders for people, that they, they become the focus uh, of all kinds of debate. Uh, and that's been true with uh, the work of China Mayville almost as soon as it began to appear in the late 90s. Uh, genre of people, so people who work on science fiction, fantasy, and the Gothic, uh, and all of those slipstream things in between, got very excited very quickly about this kind of work. Um, all of what I call the hard body theory boys uh, got terribly uh, excited uh, about this kind of stuff, stopped talking about Bataille, and started talking about um, Lovecraft and the, the kind of stuff that we've been uh, hearing uh, here and there through the day. It's also been incredibly important for left uh, political um, critics, cultural critics. Um, but it's also been really striking this summer, I think, that, that um, the work and China Mayville himself has become really quite uh, prominent in the public sphere. So to give a talk at the Edinburgh Festival um, becomes a huge sort of cultural event. The Guardian gives it a whole page. Uh, the debate is covered. Um, so the question really was, was why is it that it happens to be China Mayville's work? What is it about it that seems to produce this um, kind of focus, this kind of interest of which this weird council is one symptom. John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, thank you. I've, 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 <laughs> no, I've thought of about five different answers, so I don't know which one I'm going to choose. Um, <clears throat> what, for me, you know, what's the power of uh, the work for me? Uh, my primary requirement, and I think it's something that uh, is very easy to lose sight of and forget because it's so obvious uh, when I read a, a story, is that it gives me pleasure. Uh, and uh, I think that China's work is extremely pleasurable uh, to read. What kind of pleasure does it give? Uh, I think that has something to do with fantasy, and it has something to do with the creation of a, a fantastic community a fantastic sense of community that uh, one, uh, one imbibes or one participates in uh, when reading certain writers. And why is China's work better at doing that <laughs> than a lot of other people? Why does it seem to uh, include a lot of interesting people? Uh, and uh, why do, when I go to meetings with people in the political science department and they say, hey, have you read The City in the City? Um, well, I think that has to do with uh, intellectual uh, expansiveness. Uh, and a, uh, I mean, I don't know how to put it better than that, that uh, there's, a, there's a real 
conceptual generosity and breadth uh, of what the, the, the fiction touches upon and allows people to think about. Sure. We don't have to do it in order. But... John saw my answer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I do have a sort of similar answer, and, and sort of like John, I can speak to um, what drew me to the fiction. Um, and, and I think expansiveness, the term that John used, used um, is is a good term and it's an interesting one because I think one of the reasons uh, and this this council has been a, a good indication of that because we have people coming from a number of disciplines and speaking of the interest that um, China's fiction um, brings from their discipline that um, there's a way in which um, China's work speaks across a broad range of audiences because he himself is engaged in and writes in a number of venues so he's been um, engaged in international law, and he's published art scholarly articles on that. He's a very good critic of literature himself, and so he has been a participant in the debates that have recently become quite central in um, science fiction, fantasy, horror, genre theory about you know where are the lines, what are the lines, why are we drawing these lines. So his own critical interventions, I think, um, speak to a number of uh, people from different disciplines, and for me, I'm very interested in interdisciplinarity, and so that's one of the reasons I was attracted to work where I could have these kinds of conversations with people across disciplines. And another part of the expansiveness that I think is very important is that, um, for instance, today we've heard a number of comparisons um, to Kafka, and we've also heard a number of comparisons to Lovecraft, and so we have kind of a very high culture pole and a very low culture pole, um, uh, if I can use that term, or at least a pulp kind of sensibility. And I think that that's one of the really important things about the kind of work that Chan is doing and why I'm very grateful that he is getting the kind of public attention that he is, is because he's able to speak about the way that um, these fantastic tropes um, capture something about our contemporary reality that people want to think about, that's important to think about, but he does it in a way that um, speaks to people coming with high culture sensibilities who get the Kafka references, but without um, disdaining the pulp sensibilities, the value of that, that, that um, um, unlike my um, least favorite literary figure, uh, Margaret Atwood, who will write a science fiction novel and call it not a science fiction novel because there's a sense that once it becomes good, it's no longer science fiction, that China has never disparaged um, the fact that he partakes equally of all those cultures, and that for that, that's an important thing for me. Excellent. Um, I mean, I have shared answers or shared responses as well, but, but I was thinking actually back to, to Wyatt, back to the 90s, and back to Wired magazine, the first UK edition, which had on the front a picture of Thomas Paine, and the headline was, We Have the Power to Start the World Again which was a ludicrous demand or a ludicrous assumption about what technology was going to do and also a really strange conjunction where technology and Silicon Valley technology claimed to be able to both deliver freedom in terms of consumption and freedom as a value and for there to be no, no clash there and of course there was and I think that there's a kind of disenchantment with the technological sublime, a particular kind of technological sublime a wired sublime, if you like, that came out, came out of that really, particularly for the left or for anybody interested in information technology and communication as having something to do with agendas for social justice, actually. And I think that kind of pushed, if you like, or produced a space for thinking about possible worlds and possible futures differently and in a way that went further than or went differently than, or did something different, either than a kind of technological sublime as it's given to people by Wired, but also perhaps the Wired world which is being delivered as an actually achieved so-called utopia right now, environmental wiredness. And so then China's work is environmental and speaks in that way to a sensibility that is environmentally wired, if you like, but does something different. And I think that might, might be a reason why it's found its time. But within that, I think there's something really interesting if you come from the left, which is you enter into these environments, and just when you're thinking these environments are so seductive and so beautiful, you're forced by the story and by its savagery, actually, 
to come up against the social reality of what's going to happen in them. So the train you know, doesn't get there. So that's why I think it's always time. <coughs> yeah, great, great. Jim. Um, I, I, well, okay, all, all of the all the easy ones have been taken. So <laughs> uh, um, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of talk about it, uh, it as um, as it why I write scholarship about it and, and sort of how how I come to it that way. Because um, I, I I liked China's work for a really long time, um, and and then. Um, he wrote um, on London, uh, his first uh, you know, novel for young readers, and that's actually what uh, my scholarly specialty is, is, is children's literature. And so up until then, you know, um, I had just kind of been enjoying it because I really liked it, and that was all there was to it. Um, but then there were two main things that started driving my scholarly interest in his work, especially as part of my own specialty. One is that there's, um, there's an an old tradition of radical children's literature. Um, and there's been a lot of really interesting scholarship on radical children's literature. But the scholarship always talks about it as something in the past, as something from the 30s, maybe as late as the 50s. And that um, it was sort of something to reflect on and, and uh, maybe even feel nostalgic about, actually. Um, and so I really liked these books as coming from a sensibility um, where they're works for young readers, and they have something that could be called radical at the, at the heart of them, and it's, it's a different agenda from what would have been in the 30s, but still something that, that connects back to that. So I really like that. Also, um, and Tony mentioned something about this offhand just a little while ago in his talk. Um, teaching and writing about um, a London and rail seat is, is wonderful for me because it allows me to highlight um, the fact that categories such as YA are bullshit from the beginning, right? <laughs> and, and, and in fact, the category of children's literature, too, to, to a, a certain extent, is, is bullshit itself, um, at, which I think is what it says in Barnes & Noble, with children's literature, bullshit. Right? <laughs> and I but um, I, I, because I'm able to talk because I'm able to show them in class, you know, here's a Perdido Street Station, and I'm just going to open to a random page from here, and you can see some immediate differences between that and in London, but you can also see some real similarities there. And it allows us to start talking about, uh, about the fact that, that, that it's bullshit, that, you know, the category of adolescent literature or children's literature is, is a construct that has certain consequences to it, and that reveals certain things about the people who made it up. Uh, much more than they do reveal anything about some true natural category of childhood or adolescence. And so I, uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed this work for how it lets me complicate, um, complicate the definition of, of my field too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to try that open in a minute, but I've got a kind of supplementary question, um, which is much more of a, a focus on on sort of academic discourse as well, I suppose, and, how, and why certain, again, certain authors appeal to that kind of academic discourse. I mean, I don't know about you, but at every, at every panel, I'm totally convinced by the positions that the, that the speakers have given today, even though they are manifestly, you know, they're, they're not compatible. You can't kind of, uh, the way that, that that sort of structure of the city and the city uh, and the breach in between speaks to so many different kind of disciplinary structures or possible ways of thinking. You know, whether it's linguistic, whether it's binary, whether it's um, Marxist, whether it's Freudian and so on. And I wonder if there is something perhaps, uh, speaking about us, narcissistic almost, in, in trying to, in, in getting a sort of loving reflection back of what our interests are in these kind of things. And whether there are certain then authors who do that, I mean, I, I, I feel that my whole career is, is, is actually a narcissistic one in that I felt that Ballard did that. And you can listen to papers on J.J. Ballard that are Deleuzean, that are Baudrillardian, that are Marxist, that are, and they're all equally convincing somehow. They're all, so, so, I mean, do you have this sense too that there's something kind of, open, there's an open matrix to these kind of texts that, that um, you're responding to? 
you narcissists. <laughs> <laughs> So, and any reactions? We don't have to go through in order. Just any reactions to whether you think. Well, I, I think I think that has to be true. Uh, there, uh, there's a really brilliant paper on how Hawthorne came to be the centerpiece of American literature, uh, American literary studies, and and uh, it, it opens up with I think it's Ben Jonson's idea that uh, Shakespeare is great because uh, he's unchangeable. You know that across the centuries. He's, he remains himself kind of wonderful. And uh, that she said, um, I doubt that was true with Shakespeare. It's certainly not true with Hawthorne that, you know, from generation to generation, we wind up saying things that completely contradict one another about what's great about Hawthorne. And I think, um, I think the real challenge then, um, I think God, it's his and not mine for China, <laughs> is that um, uh, the temptation would be, okay, just become the blankest projection screen possible in order to remain meaningful to whoever wants to throw whatever nonsense up on me. And I, I, uh, and I don't sense, you know, and, and I don't sense China giving in to that. I, I sense um, uh, maybe, this is, maybe this is it. I'm making it up as I go along, but maybe this is it, that there is a, a willingness to be um, open and honest about uh, what interests him all right, but then also, um, I think a really charming um, self-criticism as well. For to take the Iron Council for an example, I, I one of the reasons I like that book so much is uh, I I felt like it's a a book saying I love revolution. Revolution is necessary. Revolution is imminent. Also. Um, revolution is problematic, and it's often organized badly, you know, and, um, it, and it always has consequences we didn't anticipate. And I, and I loved those two things struggling with, with each other there. And maybe that's something that allows some projection, as it were, without being just a, a blank screen. Really good answer. Anybody else? I'll go. Uh, <laughs> pick us up. Uh, uh, which probably just means I'm denying my own narcissism. But, um, to try to put a positive spin on, on the narcissism. I mean, I think we do seek out um, works that speak about things that interest us. And so, um, uh, Raj and I were talking about this earlier, like um, writers like Ballard, writers like Donna Lowe is another writer I enjoy, um, that they're grappling, or writers like Pynchon, they're grappling with questions about um, representation and reality with language, with meaning, they're grappling with them in an informed way and we as um, literary and cultural scholars are also grappling with these questions. So inevitably there, there is an element if, um, you know, if not of narcissism, perhaps of laziness, that it's much easier to work on work that's talking about things you already know about. But to put the positive spin on it, um, I think there's also, there's a sense in which it's also a, um, it's a dialogue that writers who are engaged with and informed about these kind of critical questions, um, who are reading theory as well, um, who are you know experiencing the same culture and reacting to it and writing about it, that fiction is another kind of theorizing, the same way um, the criticism that we write is a kind of theorizing, and so that it's um, different ways of grappling with the same problems and talking to one another across these different kinds of discursive formations and that I find that valuable if also possibly narcissistic. <laughs> okay, I think that's oh, go, go ahead, Caroline, go ahead and then we'll go I think in the in the field that I write in, in because I'm looking at technology and culture and their intersection, in a sense there's certain fields of literary study which are kind of predefined. The question then is what you do with them and how they resonate with the way that you're thinking and do more than become descriptive or be able to be objects that one can use to be more than descriptive with because theory that recapitulates its descriptive object would, would not tell you anything. It is a narcissistic mirror. But I think um, one, of the, one of the ways that I think that works for me is, is, to, is to think about the intentions behind not only the genre but the intentions within the genre because I think one of the things that's problematic to think about in terms of fantasy, for me at least, is to think about the notion of what the genre does. Because I think that that leaves a really big problem, which is about what the author within the genre does to do that. And I, and I think that that matters very much in relation to fantasy in particular, in relation to its orientation to the future and its critical or non-critical engagement with that. So that's, that's my job. Uh, I, <clears throat> one of the things that I've heard people 
repeat a number of times today is uh, that the uh, the works with a number of different works people talk about uh, did not reduce themselves to allegory, and um, which I totally agree with. Um, and one of the one of the primary characteristics of a good piece of science fiction or a good piece of fantasy is that the, the worked out intricate complexity of the situation has its own logic and is not merely an allegorical representation of another. On the other hand, however, the fact that it gets said over and over uh, it means that there is a temptation to allegorize and there is a, a kind of allegorical energy uh, that's constantly working uh, within it, and, and, and uh, that uh, kind of—it's a kind of luminosity, almost, you know, that uh, of, of ideas uh, that um, are at the same time not uh, allowed to dominate this other storytelling impulse. And I think it's that tension between the two of them that probably uh, draws me the most. Uh, narcissistically speaking, uh, into the uh, uh, interest with, uh, with Chinese fiction. Mm -hmm. Jim? Yeah, I just, I, I'm really glad you said that, John. That's something that, that I've been thinking too and kind of nervous about saying out loud because you're right, there's an awful lot of, it's not allegory, and Mayable doesn't like allegory, but uh, when, during Dougal's talk, actually, this is one of the, the notes that I made. Uh, so China dislikes fantasy as allegory, fine, but isn't there a metafictional or at least elusive habit in, in his work, one that points outside the book and nudges the reader to think about some parallel to the train, for example, outside the book. And isn't that functionally similar to allegory? I, I think there, there are certainly differences between that and allegory, especially because I, I, tend, to, I tend to associate allegory with a, a, a really outdated moralism you know, that, that isn't there. Um, but yeah, it does, it does feel like one of the reasons we keep saying it's not allegory is because it, you might think it's allegory, you know, that there's something functionally similar. In it. That, I, th I think that's a really important insight, because there's a sense in which the prose is full of all of these hooks um, which you can kind of get caught on and you feel incredibly smug, you know, where you're like, you you spotted, <laughs> you finally understand the reference. Right. And then you hear do the thing and you realise, I don't know anything about it. Like, no, an <laughs> uh, and that sort of sense of, 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 you, of, of it kind of being sort of not quite controllable, containable beyond you means that as an academic kind of thinker, you know, you're constantly sort of projecting these kind of uh, controls inside it. Even though you know that you generate a coherence which then breaks down or that, that, that moves in a different kind of way, and you know that's being done to you, nevertheless, your interpretive frenzy won't kind of switch off in a kind of curious way. Yeah. I'm going to open this to the floor. Anyone who wants to kind of contribute to this conversation, Andy? Yeah, yeah just, just to go from what John was saying, I wonder if particular as academics were pattern finding, mm. pattern finding animals. So, whether it's we're looking for models or patterns rather than allegories, but the, the, the panel this morning where one that the it's not an allegory it's set also talking about love. Uh, it struck me that the other writer that did like an allegory was Tolkien. Yeah, that's right. Saying, that's right. The Lord of the Rings is is not an allegory about the Second World War. Which uh, uh, which one the kind of lawyer lawyer bit of you think? So what is it an allegory? <laughs> <laughs> it's an allegory for the, the Great War and the, the end, yeah, parades and but in fantasy form. Uh, so I mean, may, maybe it's part of our pattern finding that we're, we're looking for all these parallels, and um, because there's there's some dialectics or polyphony or or heteroglossy or whatever term you want to use at work, mm -hmm. sure. there's competing models, not which quite fit. It's also the case there's not academics and China, there's readers. Yeah. And there's readers that take texts apart and readers that recombine them, I mean physically as well as in terms of reception. And I think that the what happens to those books which become ideas isn't in anybody's control. And I think they might become allegories like it or not, because that's how they start mm -hmm. to function right. within a network of yeah. cultural associations and cultural politics. The street is finally using something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sort of the pool. Well, I yeah, I mean, um, I mean, the person making it, but I think, but I think, 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 I think,
readers are also patterned by keeping creatures too, you know, that's, that, that's the thing. So, I mean, uh, you know, there might, whether or not there's a lot of narcissism in academia. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, mean, I, know, I mean, I know from my experience, from my experience you know, I've got, I've got, you know, I've had students who you know, do, have, have, have actually come to Kate you know, to do science fiction because they are a child of the Eagle fan, or they're a Neil Gaiman fan, or, the, or an Alan Moore fan, or whatever. So, you know, so, so that's, you know, you know before the, <laughs> the dread group of narcissism was going hold of them by academics, you know, they're, actually, they, they, they're already in that group, you know, so, they, so, you know, I think you've got to start thinking about, they're always, they're, they're, there was plainly something happening there for, 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 for a lot of young readers in their teens, reading Mayville and loving it. And I think that's the, that's the key thing. So whatever academics might be doing, there's also that readerly pleasure there going on there, you know, all the time as well. So, I think that's... so it's a comment from Cheryl first. Yeah, um, just to come um, on the, the, the alibi thing, the, the point that's made on the end here about alibi having some sort of moral dimension to them, that it, it can have an alibi or something, the purpose is to point out that there is this thing and there are good things coming around that. Um, narcissistically thinking, the reason that I love Chinese work is because there's an enormous level of nuance there. That it's not just this thing, it's not just that. There's so much that you can do it, and that allows you to see things in many, many different aspects. Yeah, so maybe it's, so I, I kept saying that it's functionally similar to allegory. Maybe it's functionally similar except that uh, instead of this thing equaling that thing, this thing equals several different things, some of them contradictory simultaneously. Maybe that's, we like that? Okay, we'll say that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more, maybe one more intervention or one more thought. Uh, anything that anyone wants to add? Uh, I know it's been the end of a long day, but it's been a fantastic day, actually. Um, really, really, really absorbing patients. Uh, um, um, if you feel as overwhelmed as I do, then uh, I'm sure you want to drink. I think the plan is... What's the plan? <laughs> Tony, what's the plan? Uh, to go over to the cinema, to 43 Border Square. Um, okay. and but, you, have, you have a bit more time where people can stretch yeah. their legs. My, my suggestion is that... Um, I, I'm not sure if it's open, but, but Rada uh, is just on uh, Mallet Street, which has a bar. So it, I, I might lead people that way, and we can see if the bar is open and then have a quick drink. And then I can lead you again to Gordon Square's... Well, the, the Institute of Education bar is open. Let's do that. So, yeah, um, let's do that. Yeah. Perfect. What let's time do you want us to be there? What time do you want us to be at our seats? We will, I will lead you there. Right. Yeah. 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 Can you just quickly thank our plenary panel?